you inside? What's always been really important to me was just the heart of this character and who he is and what makes him who he is. We tried to sort of distill out the spirit uh, of the source material. And enough of us have been through adaptations that have gone not the way we wanted them to, to be as careful as possible. I was not familiar with the comic book at all until I started doing my research to put my presentation together. So I started reading, reading some of the graphic novels and it was there that I really sort of learned uh, who Constantine was and what the heart of his character was. John Constantine, I believe, is one of the greatest comic characters ever created. Constantine was a bad boy and people like bad boys. <laughs> Constantine was created by Alan Moore, whom many people consider to be the greatest writer in the comic book field. The creation of Constantine was one of those kind of fluke things, as I think many great creations wind up being. He started as a real cameo appearance in Swamp Thing 37. The story was called Growth Patterns, and it's featured in the Curse graphic novel. Constantine had a real appeal when we first introduced him in the book, but it wasn't an overwhelming, you know, thousands of letters a day give this guy his own series. We on our own recognized that there was something special about him, and we launched his own book. The first issue of Hellblazer came out in 1987. When I took over writing John Constantine and developing, I suppose my main concern was to do the character's potential justice. What Jamie Delano did with the series when he first started writing the monthly book was to really create a past for him, um, give him a family, Jamie really played into the political uh, atmosphere of the Thatcher-Reagan era of the 80s. It was basically a parody of the rampant capitalism that was stepping on the gas, and it was a lot of fun to write, and great characterizing BMW driving yuppies as corrupt, greedy demons from hell, and allowing Constantine to sort of beat them at their own game by manipulating the hellish stock markets. When I first began developing John Constantine, the imprint that later became known as Vertigo did not exist. DC Comics began to experiment with some books that would bring back the old horror thriller genre and do it being less fettered by the restrictions found in a typical DC comic book. Ultimately, this turned into the Vertigo line of comics, which is a mature line of comics. Vertigo was developed on the back of Hellblazer and numerous other books such as Animal Man and The Sandman. This was a chance for Constantine to really launch a whole new line for DC and uh, I think he did so incredibly well. His cynicism balanced with his knowledge of otherworldly things really makes him the essence of Vertigo. John Constantine is in your face. He will tell you what's on his mind. He really doesn't care what you say or what you think. He's the James Dean of the occult world. He was about the most reluctant hero I'd ever come across. You know, instead of like doing it for very noble reasons, he was actually doing it to be devil the devil. He wanted to, you know, just take on demons for the, for the thrill of it. He's a manipulator, he's a con man. He'll use magic, he'll call up an old friend who dabbles in the dark arts, but he's more about manipulating people than using magic. And I think that's the key of what keeps his character so fresh, is that it's a head game all the time. He's a smart ass. In many ways, I think he's a lot of what his readers would like to be. I wish I had his ability to slip through the cracks of whatever the problems are, deal with the weird stuff in life, and do it all with a smirk. We were very excited that Constantine was gonna get his own film because he's a complex character, but his role is clear and direct. And I think that's one of the elements why he was able to make the leap to the big screen. Hellblazer was something I'd always wanted to do something with. 
and uh, you know, I got to find where I'd sold a few scripts, and people would say to you, you know, what do you want to do next? Um, it was, you know, the top of my list. Actually, the project came to me as a um, as a comic. Kevin Broadbin brought it to me. What I saw was an opportunity to do a very classy classic horror film like The Exorcist. It's interesting because the time I set it up, um, I had not gotten X-Men going yet, so it was before the comic book craze, but it was just such a good story. I had never done comic books, but I hooked into the character and I brought in a pitch about the guy. And that's when they, I think, started saying, well, maybe this is the guy to rewrite it. I was handed, I think, Dangerous Habits and Original Sentence. And when I started reading through those, that introduced me to the character, and especially Dangerous Habits. It was such a different kind of story about a guy, really basically, that was dying of his own habit. And yet he had faced so many dangerous things in his life, and here what was killing him was a cigarette. Movies nowadays, they're, they're about saving the world this kind of story or about saving a city from a bad guy and I thought if you had a character like John really that's the concentration you could put on is whether or not he's going to live through this cancer that he's got is he going to beat it not whether he saves the world just him saving his own butt was interesting enough for me a friend of mine who was an executive at Warner Brothers sent me a copy of the script to rewrite and uh, I read it and I thought it was amazing and that I really didn't want to rewrite it because I thought the voice was really very good. It's hard to do minimalist noir, I'm not even sure it's a genre, but this had this very take it for granted tone. I love the fact that the movie never bothered to try to explain itself. Uh, since Constantine takes the world for granted, uh, so does the film. There's elements from several uh, of the comic book stories. That was one of the hardest things, was to figure out what to take from the comics in terms of, like, plot, and then what to, you know, disregard because it wouldn't, it wouldn't work in a film. There's elements from the very start with Chaz the Taxi Driver, Papa Midnight, and Ellie, a demon. Midnight, I think, is the closest to the comic, actually. I think Midnight was always an ally, adversary, that kind of guy that you don't quite trust but yet, at the end of the day, if you had to go into war with somebody, you'd go get him. The other character is Chaz. I mean, his, his sidekick kind of, actually, he's more like an ally in the comic books. He's a guy that's about the same age. They've gone through a lot of the same stuff together. Uh, it was an interesting relationship. It was probably really the most adult relationship that John had in the comic. Now, in the movie, it's taken a different, uh, different stand, and Chaz becomes more of a sidekick. When I was a kid, I could see things, things humans aren't supposed to see. Late in the game, we finally, at least I did, thought we need some sort of backstory to say, where did this guy come from? So I said, you know, if a guy saw demons all the time, what was he like as a kid? <laughs> I'm kind of surprised, though, that the main character has stayed the way he is all the way through. I mean, every single director, everybody that came on wanted that guy to stay who he was. The idea was to go with a director with a visual sense, to sort of make sure the Constantine stayed young and hip. So therefore, we were looking to a younger, newer director. We met with many video and commercial directors, but Francis stood out, and he was smart in that we understand if from their work that they can cover the visual sense of it. But what everybody worries about is can they tell a story and can they draw a performance? And that's what he focused on right away. Keanu was actually the last person for me to meet with. He was kind of the last rung in everybody that I had to, to go through to get the job. And he had been off in Australia working on the Matrix films. And I believe it was the day he arrived home or the day after he arrived home from Australia, having been gone for 18 months. I had him come down to my office and I filled the conference room with my presentation that I had built up over these five months. 30 poster boards filled with stuff. I mean, it really sort of laid it out. You could really kind of see what the movie was gonna feel like. And I think he liked what he saw. And you know, you know, we honestly really saw eye to eye about the character and about the story. In the history and tradition of going from, any, from one form to any form, has always kind of brought about disappointments for people in terms of how they, you know, relate to the source material and to its interpretation. But I think that the heart and soul of it, we've really tried hard to uh, keep intact. 
When we found out that Constantine was not going to be British, of course, being the comic book company, we were surprised and wondering why that approach was being taken. But Keanu Reeves turned out a wonderful performance. I think the film's an extraordinarily good translation. Francis Lawrence and the team really went rather than to the iconography or the outer dressing of what the character is, to the essence of the attitude. It's a guy who just has problems in general with the rules in the world, and he has problems in general with the idea of fate, that there are rules he has to live by, good and bad. And that's what I've really fought for, and I even fought to put more of that back in there and more of that attitude back in there, that Constantine attitude. There's very little about the uh, character of John Constantine in the graphic novel and the comics that is anything like Keanu. They're very different physical types, um, different uh, nations of origin, but we tried to sort of distill out the spirit of the source material rather than the actual sort of physical representation. I didn't think bleaching Keanu's hair blonde was going to be right. We tried an olive colored trench coat. All throughout pre-production, I thought he was going to wear an olive colored trench coat. And when we first tested it, it didn't look good. So we went with a black one because that's what looked best and looked right for Keanu. Our process with Keanu and Keanu's process with this movie was to do that, to sort of feel Constantine. And Keanu got this guy pretty quickly. Keanu's completely, totally committed to what he does, to his work. As soon as I'll go, Keanu, and he'll go, yeah, and he, he's not there, and he's John. He's like deep in the character. There's only so many women who sort of feel like if you place them in this world, could be psychic. Rachel, she's also physical enough that um, I bought that she could be a detective. And so it was that sort of combination that really drew me to her. But you just don't know when you meet a director how they're gonna be with uh, actors or how they're gonna be in a set, or how they're gonna be under the pressure of a six-month shoot or a huge studio movie. And he has never, ever once, for one second, let me down, ever. The other one soul that would come up here to collect myself. We toiled and toiled over Satan just because, you know, you've seen so many versions. You've seen the beast, you've seen the seductive woman, you've seen the child, you've seen the well-dressed man. And it was, okay, who's our Satan gonna be? I just somehow saw him like Fagin, you know, this nasty, gross, kind of funny. I mean, just, you know, the nastiest of the nasty. And I thought Peter would be perfect for that. Satan is just this insouciant son of a bitch who never really needs to get angry. I mean, he's Satan. It's like, you know, he doesn't give a shit. Your ego is astounding. Gabriel. Tilda Swinton is the person that I wanted for the role of Gabriel since the second I started thinking about the casting of this movie. You know, I never thought in a million years she would ever do it. I really didn't. Three, two, one, action! His idea was a sort of unisex, asexual. He wanted Gabriel to be androgynous. It was this sort of slight manipulation to try and get her in. You know, we thought, okay, well, let's make sure we have some more mainstream names in this movie, you know, other than Keanu, before we ask for Tilda Swinton, who's more of an independent film actress. And we sort of plotted and planned and plotted and planned. It was time to go in and, you know, the, the head of the studio just said, oh, her, she's great, sure. And it was no, no fight, no problem whatsoever. I was sitting watching the first rough cut as they began to put the footage together. And you get to that beautiful scene where Constantine has gone to Gabriel, somewhat in search of God's mercy, somewhat to let steam off. And you'd have that beatific Tilda Swinton expression as she bends down and says, You're fucked. That's vertigo, right in that moment. There's something special about the character. He's the guy who is out there on the front line dealing with the dark forces in the world that other people don't want to deal with. Doing it in a non-traditional way. It's difficult for me to say why John Constantine got through his first 12 issues. I think we just struck a lucky chord, found some resonance in the hearts of the readers that allowed Constantine to develop into the, the institution that it's now becoming. He's been to hell and back. 
Nothing has seemed to stop him yet, so I think he has many, many years left.